how low can I speak while you can still hear me in the back? OK, I'm not going to try to get you to fall asleep, so <clears throat> I'll try to speak up a little bit. I'm sure it'll be fine. Um, welcome back from lunch, everyone. Um, are we going to count how many people fall asleep after lunch? <laughs> or do you just want me to not point you out if you do that? <clears throat> OK, I see people don't want me to point you out, so I will point you out. Um, that's, sort of, that's what I get out of this talk, right? Hopefully, you can get something else out of this talk. So uh, again, welcome back from after lunch. Uh, my name is Magnus Hagander. I work for a company called Red Pill Impro. Uh, I work out of Stockholm in Sweden, normally, uh, or in theory, every now and then. Uh, I am a consultant within, uh, working with Postgres and a couple of other products as well. So uh, I travel to a lot of different places and do my work, but that's uh, where my base is. Uh, within Postgres, I'm part of the core team. Uh, I'm one of the uh, committers on the database. But I'm not going to talk about any of that stuff. I'm now going to focus on the stuff that you know, is actually about using Postgres rather than building it. So if you're here in order to learn how Postgres backups work internally, sorry, you're in the wrong place, even though you're at PGCon. Uh, so we're going to talk about backup strategies. <coughs> uh, because you know, we all need backups, right? We may think we don't need backups, but yeah, we all need backups. So a typical thing when I talk to Unfortunately, in far too many cases, I talk to customers about you know, the concept of backups when I, I meet them first, like what are your backup policies and what are all of this stuff. And you know, you get, but we don't need backups, we have replication. Yeah, how many people think replication will save you? Replication is awesome, but it is not a replacement for backup. You know, no matter how many nodes you are replicating to. Even if you're using the cloud, actually that's probably makes it worse. Uh, but you come across quite a lot of places where people are literally saying, you know, we have five replicas in four different countries, so we don't need backups. And you know, then someone actually runs this thing called an SQL query and does drop table. That replicates fast. That replicates much faster than any other data. Like you measure the uh, replication delay, that's as close as zero as you can get. That tends to go real fast. So replication does not replace backups. So then people talk, well, you know, we have clustering, right? We have failover, high availability clusters using these you know, $100,000 products. It's the same thing. It doesn't protect you. It, these are both designed to protect you against hardware failure. They're not designed to protect you against application error. Postgres bugs, yes, we do have them. <laughs> Hopefully fewer than many other products, but we do have them. Or user error. Like, there's no way that these high availability products will actually help you. <clears throat> Another classic we see is, you know, but I got a, I bought a SAN, right? It comes with a hundred percent uptime guarantee, so you're safe. It might even have, you know, built-in snapshots that run inside the same SAN with a hundred percent uptime guarantee. I mean, that's awesome, isn't it? Really? How many people have ever run into that? I mean, what I say is like, really? Can that possibly work? Does the concept of a hundred percent guarantee exist? No, it doesn't. Like it, it literally does not exist. <clears throat> I know there's a good news story. It's now about a bit over a year ago, uh, back home in Sweden, where one of the largest um, outsourcing providers was just generally outsourcing, you know, running, I guess we almost call it cloud now, but traditional machines in, in virtualized environments. They ran it for you. Um, they had one of these beautiful sands with 100% uptime guarantee, multiple locations, you know, every single bell and whistle there was. Guess how fast their corruption replicated? They lost four and a half thousand virtual machines. Production systems for you know, some of the most high profile government organizations in Sweden, for example. Um, they are, sadly enough, still relying on this, even though it didn't work. <clears throat> so you need backups, right? That's sort of the, the first takeaway. There's no real substitute for proper backups. Uh, we combine them. We don't do just backups, but you do need the backups. Uh, and there's a lot of things that people do when you start talking about backups. So the first thing you do is, well, you have a plan for backups. This is something that most organizations actually end up having. You, know, you have some sort of, you know, what's my backup interval? How often am I going to take this thing? Uh, how long am I going to keep the backups around? Some people keep them forever. That eventually becomes expensive. Uh, but it's doable. And you somehow plan for what's your performance impact? Like, because backup is not free. It will cost your performance while you're taking your backups. These are part of the backup planning. And this is stuff that we need to do. But what's surprisingly common that people don't have is a restore plan. Like backups are useless if you don't restore them. 
Backup plans are mostly useless unless you actually plan for what's going to happen when you restore. It usually doesn't matter if it takes a full day to take your backup. As long as it doesn't you know, prevent production from working, it doesn't matter if it takes a day. If it takes a day to restore, that's not going to be popular, depending, of course, on exactly what the system is. But while you're restoring, your system is down. We all talk about hot backups, right? We've been talking about this for, I don't know, 15 years in, in the database world, or 20 years, where we're saying we can take the backups without affecting production. We're never going to have hot restore, because when we start our restore process, the system is already down. So we needed to come back up as quickly as possible. So that is a much, much more important thing. And it's something that we do need to consider in our planning, which means we might need to combine multiple different solutions for solving different problems. Replication is excellently for you know, restore speed. You just move your virtual IP over to the other machine, and you're done. Unfortunately, it doesn't really protect you. Printing your full database on you know, pieces of paper and have someone type it back in, yeah, that's kind of a backup. It takes forever to restore that. I wouldn't, it, it, also, it is also ridiculously expensive, even if you find cheap labor to do the typing, uh, and quite error prone. <coughs> so uh, let's take a, a, a bit of an overview about the options that we have in Postgres. We actually have a lot of options. Uh, I'm not going to talk about all of them, uh, but if we talk about the sort of core options, we can split them in two in Postgres. We can work with something called logical backups. This is backups at sort of the SQL level of the database. Uh, this is what we typically refer to as dumps which is why the tools used in Postgres uh, is PG dump, and a couple of products around that one. This is what you'll typically find in a lot of sort of non-enterprise databases, if you will. Uh, this is the only thing that Postgres did prior to version 8.0. Uh, the other option we have is physical backups, which is we do the backups as some sort of a block or file system level well beneath the level of SQL. Now, we can then break this one up into multiple different options as well. We can talk about the file system backups. We get something called PG-based backup. We can do what we call manual-based backups. But they all group, and they all work the same. And they group into sort of these two main groups, which are logical and physical backups. Uh, and the logical backups are really, again, if you've ever come from a non-Postgres database, if you come from the open source world of non-Postgres databases, you will have done logical backups, because that's basically the only thing they do. Uh, it is. What you get when you do this PG dump thing is you get a big, long SQL script that has all your schema. It has all your create table, create column, uh, create index, create function, create all the other multitude of objects that you can create in the Postgres database. And then it loads your data with a normal copy command, same as if you were just loading it from a CSV file on disk. There is no shortcut anywhere in what the logical backups do. They are regular Postgres clients. So you can do that. You can just have you know, a Perl script or a Python script that does the same thing. Now, we built one for you that doesn't forget about some objects. So if you're taking backups, we do suggest that you use the, <laughs> the built-in tools and don't build your own. But there's nothing preventing you from doing that if you wanted to. Um, it gives you great flexibility because, again, it's at the SQL level. You all know that Postgres can do a lot of interesting things with SQL. Well, you can use that for your backups. You can do a lot of cool filtering. You can do a lot of good options with with PG dump, but it's not necessarily the greatest one for performance. Um, I'm sure many of you have tried it. Has anyone of you tried? Has anyone tried to PG dump a database bigger than 100 gigabytes? Okay, a couple of people. Bigger than a terabyte. Bigger than five. <laughs> yeah, I am still sad for those of you who had to PG dump something that's bigger than a terabyte. 100 gigabyte is fine. Terabyte, that's when it's starting to get painful get up to multiple or you know, tens of terabytes, it's just not going to work all the way. But it gets you pretty far. And it is very simple to use. Again, PG dump is the main tool that we use to do these dumps. Uh, PG dump will dump one database. That is important to remember. If you have multiple databases on your system, you need to run PG dump multiple times. Uh, it is sad when you run into people that forget this. Now they have a backup of one database, and they put the production data in another one. Yes, I've run into this. Uh, it uses a regular Postgres connection. Uh, what it does is it basically, when PG dump starts, it opens a transaction. And then using the MVCC functionality in Postgres, that gives you a guaranteed consistent snapshot across your whole database. And while the backup is running, uh, you can do anything else in the database, almost while it's running. There are locks taken, so you can, for example, not drop a table while it's being backed up. Probably a good thing. 
but you can do all your inserts, updates, and deletes. You can create new tables while the backup is running. They won't be in the backup, but you can create them. So you will get a backup that is consistent as of when pgdump was started. So if it takes you 10 hours to run pgdump, the backup will be 10 hours old when it finishes, but it will be consistent. Uh, likewise, if it takes you a week to run pgdump, these are the interesting things that happens when you get into these multi-terabyte databases. It will take a week to run it. Uh, and that's painful, but it will be consistent as of a week ago. Uh, pgdump is single-threaded. It is single-threaded for now, because hopefully none of you have deployed 9.3 beta 1 in production. Uh, but with 9.3 beta 1, you can get parallel pgdump. So it will be in 9.3 that you can scale out across multiple CPUs. Uh, but other than that, it is single-threaded, meaning it will use a single connection to the database, meaning it will use one of your 64-core you know, database server will use one of them to do the backups. The other ones will just be idle, because you know, that's why you paid for them. <coughs> but it usually turns out that this is probably a good idea. I would say I might, on a 64-core machine, yeah, I'd probably use parallel PG dump. I'd probably use two or three processes, two or three in parallelism. But the point is, if we actually have, say we have a 16-core machine, we run 16 cores on pgdump, who's going to run your application? pgdump will kill you in full uh, parallel mode. Now, if you're running backups, you don't want it to do that. And again, it doesn't matter how long it takes. If you're doing, say, an upgrade using dump restore, you just want it to run as fast as possible. That's when parallel pgdump is awesome. But for pure backups, it's usually not a problem that it's single-threaded because it's usually not a problem that it takes time. Uh, now, you can dump a number of different formats when you're using pgdump. It's all very simple. It's selected by uh, dash capital F, controls your format. Your backups should always, always, always be in custom formats, which is dash FC. There is no reason ever to use anything else for your backups. The default is not this. The default is plain. That will just generate a text file that is a big SQL script. Now again, take this when it comes up to multiple hundreds of gigabytes and try to do anything interesting with this text file. I mean, we can go into you know, editor wars, you know, which editor is best, but none of them is going to like this file. None of them will work well with 100 gigabytes large text files. They just won't. So custom format gives you the ability to do a lot of things. It gives you the ability to index and to inspect your backups while they're sitting over on your backup server. That's a good thing. So always use custom format. Uh, when you're using custom format, you also get compression by default. It'll, it's standard gzip style compression. I think the level is 5 or something by default. Uh, usually, database dumps tend to compress fairly well, given the output format. Even if you're storing pre-compressed binary data in your database, when copy reads it out, it gets escaped into hex, which we can then recompress. May not be the most efficient thing, uh, but it's still there's a, a gain to be had from the compression. Now, pgdump supports dumping of separate objects. You can say dump just this table, dump just this schema, dump just these five tables. Let's you do this. When you're using pgdump for backups, you should never use these functions. This is a good tool. We use it for many other things. But when you're doing backups, you need to back up the whole database. If you don't, you're not guaranteed it will restore. For example, say, well, I have 10 tables in my database. I, you can run one pgdump for each of those 10 tables manually. The problem is they each get a separate, different transactional context. They will each be individually consistent with its own table. But say you have a foreign key between these tables. Someone might have modified your data between the two different pgdumps getting into the database. Suddenly, your backup doesn't restore anymore. So when you're running a backup, you should always use pgdump for the full database. Now, we can then filter things when we restore and say, I only want to restore this one table. But when we put them in the backup, everything should be in there. <clears throat> now, as I mentioned before, so pgdump uses regular copy queries. It's a standard SQL thing. The Postgres is not that fast at doing copy. Uh, it's actually pretty slow at doing copy. It's much faster than anything else we have, uh, but it's not that fast. It uses a single backend, so a single TCP connection or Unix domain connection, a single process, a single processor core generating I.O. 
Now, Postgres is smart enough with all these copies that it will not blow away your uh, Postgres cache. Because, uh, I mean, obviously, pgdump will have to read all your data. We're backing up your data. There's no way not to read it from disk at one point or another. Now, Postgres has this feature which automatically detects when a session is running large sequential scans. Like, it's reading more data than it's ever going to fit in the cache, and it's just going to go straight through it. It will then confine that process, in this case, pgdump, or its copy, to a smaller part of the shared buffer cache and just have it evict its own buffers. So it doesn't affect the rest of the system. Now, there's still the risk that it can ruin your file system cache. That depends a lot on how your file system cache works. Usually, we end up reading every block just once. So a good file system cache will not at least be ruined, because they have similar kind of techniques to detect this type of behavior. But there is always, there will be an impact on your database caching when you run pgdump, unless your whole database fit in RAM. Like if the whole database is in the cache already, then we don't have to throw anything else out for us to get in. Uh, but there is a potential for this. Uh, and of course, not only do we read the data, we have to write this dump file somewhere. This is something that I see quite a lot of people who just don't think about. And then they run pgdump on the database server and write the dump file to disk on the database server because that's the disk that's attached to the database server. Uh, now, not only did we just add I.O. to the same disk that our database is on, we changed what was nice sequential scans reading all the data to scan a little bit, go over here and write it. Now, go back here and read, and go over here and write. Uh, so you're turning your I.O. profile into something that's really bad. Now, you can also, of course, run the dump, uh, run the dump on the local machine and store it to a different disk on the local machine. Now, now you're no longer generating this random I.O. Uh, and you're no longer fighting for the same I.O. bandwidth. But it's important to consider if you're writing it to the same disk, the writing of the dump file is probably going to cause you more performance impact than the reading of the database. Even though, yes, it happens in a separate process. It's running on the outside, but it's all on the same hardware. There is an impact there uh, that we do need to think about. Uh, now, as I mentioned, PG dump does compression by default in custom mode. And this is actually something we can use in um, some sort of sneaky way. So compression, when we run it, is run and happens in pgdump. So you can run pgdump if we run it on the database server. Obviously, the compression happens on the database server. If you run pgdump somewhere else on the network and it connects to the database server, then compression happens somewhere else on the network. And the data that's transferred between Postgres and pgdump is uncompressed. That may or may not be what you intended. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes, you know, network bandwidth is actually relatively cheap. You may have a dedicated network for your backups. And this may not at all be a problem, but it's something worth considering. Uh, now, the other use we can do for this compression is we can actually use it to throttle things. Typically, on, on, since we're using a single CPU, it tends to be the same for pretty much all the hardware that we see today. That's somewhere between compression level of 3 to 5 is where you get the maximum benefit. Uh, what that means is, well, you're going to end up, if you're running PG dump on the same machine, you end up with one PG dump using 100% of one CPU core. And then the back end that it's connected to using 100% of a different CPU core. You can't go faster than this. Your backup will go as fast as possible. But is that what you needed? Is that what you wanted? If you decrease the compression, your load will become IO bound. Right, because you have spare CPU to compress more, you just decided not to do it. So you will create more I.O. and will be, be limited in speed by I.O. But if you increase the compression, things will be slower. Your backup will take a longer time, but it will generate less I.O. And it will, in particular, generate less I.O. per second. Does it actually matter if your backup takes an hour or an hour and a half to run? If it doesn't impact the application? No, it doesn't. So I have quite often found that if you increase the compression, the backups run slower, but the impact on the system is decreased significantly because pretty much all of our database servers have spare CPU capacity. And with high compression, we're paying in CPU capacity. With low compression, we're paying with I.O. capacity. We have CPU to spare. We don't have I.O. to spare. That's the typical scenario. So if you're seeing a backup case where, where you, the backup is impacting your system too much, then try actually increasing the compression. It sounds counterintuitive, but it does quite often help. 
Uh, now, there is another thing that you can quite often do. So we said, in this case, compression happens in PG dump. What if I want to run you know, PG dump somewhere else? Yeah, you can dump it over NFS. Uh, NFS, meh, not a big fan. What you want to do is run PG dump somewhere else and write the dump file over there. But now the compression happens in the wrong place. How do we solve this? SSH. This is a pretty typical thing, right? You want it ever, well, SSH into your database server, run PG dump, maximum compression, custom format, log in, and just pipe. Let, let the SSH uh, tunneling work. This works really well. Does anyone spot the error in this command? It's not actually an error that makes it not work. This works. But there is a very stupid mistake in this thing. Sorry? SSH does its own compression. So, and compression is slow. Compressing already compressed data is even slower. And it makes it bigger. So if you're using this, you probably want to pass the compression equals no onto the SSH. Now, this default, whether it does its own compression, that depends on which platform you're on, whether it's on or off by default. Uh, it might be off by default, in which case this is not necessary. On the other hand, it never hurts to explicitly turn it off. You might want to also say, well, you know, it's also encrypted. Well, first of all, maybe that's a good thing, right? You're transferring your sensitive database backups. Might be a good thing that it's being backed up. But even so, encryption is actually much, much cheaper than compression. The way, things, the way our CPUs and the way our machines work today. Compression is the expensive thing. Uh, encryption is cheap. But you can, of course, also tell SSH to use what's called a null encryption, which means it doesn't encrypt it. Uh, I seldom come around to actually doing that. Uh, and now we got the same thing. Of course, with this, you know, dash capital Z9, means we're going to lock up one CPU core at the database server for 100%. The client here is only processing this, a simple redirect. But we're sending the data off across the network immediately, which also has the advantage that we, we're not impacting the I.O. on the server by writing data there. Um, so when we're doing a restore from PG Dump, you know, since we said, if you're using this plain text format, it all just goes into you know, PSQL or whatever. Has someone ever tried opening a 200 gigabyte SQL file in PG Admin Query Tool? It's fun. <laughs> it uses a lot more than 200 gigabytes of RAM. It's not very efficient at that, so don't do that. Uh, we use PG Restore. Uh, PG Restore works sort of, what it does is it takes this custom format and basically transparently converts it into this 200 gigabyte SQL file, except it doesn't do the whole thing at once. So it will then use a regular libpq connection, standard Postgres connection, run standard Postgres commands on it, and just restore all the data in there. Uh, and this one does support both the full database restore, which is what we do when everything is broken and we need to restore from backups, and we can use partial database restore. We can restore a single table. We can restore multiple tables. What it guarantees is that if you're doing a full database restore, the data will restore, because we had this consistent snapshot when we took the backup. And as long as we're coming from the same one, I mean, you, can, you, you have the same sort of basic problem if you restore a single table. Well, if that table had foreign keys pointing somewhere else, yeah, we're not going to be able to restore it because we'll still enforce primary, uh, both primary and, and foreign keys. But if we have independent groups of tables or something like that, we can restore these as a single unit. And it's pretty easy to use. Now, what this one does is it basically does a, well, it does a create table. Then it does a copy of all your data. Then it does create index. And then it adds your constraints. Does anyone think that's fast? These are like basically every single one of these operations are the ones we try to avoid because they're slow, and we're doing four of them. Um, this can be very slow for large databases. Now, how do we define very slow? When my restore takes multiple weeks, that is very slow. Uh, in fact, for a fair number of systems, if my restore takes two hours, that is too slow. Uh, it takes a long time to restore these once your database grows up to any level of size. I'm sure many of you have experienced this much sooner than you hit a terabyte. Backing up a terabyte is fine. Restoring it is not fun. There are a couple of things that you can do to make restore run faster. Uh, you can use the dash one flag. This is the easy one. This one's been around forever. It basically runs the whole restore as a single transaction. What PG, uh, PG restore does is begin, then restore everything, then commit. Um, the reasons why we like this, well, in general, we get fewer operations. That's not really a big win because our, our operations are so big anyway. 
Uh, the big wins are that we can enable some optimizations in the system when we do this. We can, for example, write less data to the transaction log. This only works if we're not doing replication or while archiving. But if we don't do that, it can help us a lot of things. It also comes with the advantage that if the restore were to crash for some reason, we don't have a half-restore database. Right? If you remember, we looked at what it does. It does copy, create, index, add constraint. Well, if we're unlucky and it crashes, we do the copy. We don't create our unique indexes. Now we have a dangerous database. There's no protection in that unless you use dash one. Do you have a question? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, it, it includes all the things. This is just, yeah, it includes triggers, it includes your functions, uh, rules. Uh, it does, no, it, it, it loads them after it's loaded the data. So it doesn't run the triggers during the restore. That could create a very strange restore, depending on what the triggers. So they don't run during that. Yes? I'm getting there. Uh, now, the thing you can do if you really need this thing to run faster is parallel PG restore. This is something that we had since 8.4. So we were able to restore parallel long before we were able to back up parallel. Uh, it works like sort of your typical parallel commands, which you do dash J and give it a number. And it'll just run in that many parallel sessions. So if you have this, a 32 core machine, you can run dash J 16. That'll give you 16 cores to Postgres and 16 cores to PG restore. And you know, and sometimes that will actually run 16 times faster. That's still pretty good. Now, 16 times faster than a week is still not good enough, uh, but it is much better. Uh, now, what it does is it still loads each one of your objects in a single session. So if you have one, a terabyte table, and 500 really small tables, what it will do is start a connection for this one terabyte table, then another connection will finish all of those 500 small ones, and you're still waiting for the big one. It, we can't parallelize an individual table. But usually, that's not what your database looks like. You have a number of different objects that are reasonably smart. And it tries to be smart. It knows how, in which order it has to load them to satisfy dependencies. But other than that, it tries to spread out the load not to get into that situation. It does a reasonably good job. Now, unfortunately, this one is not compatible with dash one. You can't use both of them. And in almost every case, if what you're looking for is performance, this one is better. Because this one, you can just tune up the number of processes until you hit the limit of what your disk system can do. Once you've hit the limit of your disk system, well, you're not getting any further. Uh, but you will get faster. Now, of course, if you do that, you lose the fact, uh, the, the integrity, so that if it crashes halfway through, you will have a half-restore database that you need to drop and restart your attempts. And it doesn't protect you against that. Yes? Uh, that n, uh, a typical value if you're running the restore on the same machine is half the number of cores you have. Because then you give half the cores to Postgres, half to PG restore. If you're running it on a different machine, it's the number of cores you have. Uh, that's, if that doesn't kill your I.O. system, then you have Fusion I.O. <laughs> and then you're happy because now it's fast. <laughs> there are some other interesting things that you can do. You can turn off F-Sync. Okay, this is something we should never actually, re I shouldn't recommend you do this. We should never recommend anyone turn off F-Sync. It's dangerous. It's, it, things will die. Things will get corrupt, and you won't know until it's too late. On the other hand, it's very fast. And if we are doing a whole database restore, only if we're doing the full database restore, the fact is that if it crashes at some point during the restore, we can just delete everything and start over. In that case, there's no real risk from F-Sync. The biggest risk from F-Sync is that you forget to turn it back on. And yes, I've run into this more than once. Actually, I've run into this more than once with the same customer, <laughs> uh, which is not a good sign. So yeah, that does happen. Do not forget to turn it back on. After you've turned it back on, uh, you need to flush. Obviously, you need to restart Postgres because it is that. You also need to flush the operating system caches. If you don't, you will get corruption. And you will get corruption that you won't detect. Um, so how do you do flush the OS caches to be sure about it? Well, the easiest thing really is reboot the server. If you reboot the server, you know it's flushed. There are ways that are completely different in all different operating systems. But the problem that I have with all of them is they don't give you feedback. For example, in Linux, there is something in Prox called drop file system caches, which you can tell the kernel, drop all your caches right now. And it'll, it'll just go do it. But it won't tell you when it's done. If you don't know when it's safe to start the database again, you can go in the server room and look at the disks and see when they stop flashing and hope that was it. That doesn't feel very safe to me. 
And usually when we do turn off F-Sync for these restores, you know, we may turn them off in order to save on the order of hours. You, know, you can afford the time to reboot. It doesn't take that long to do that. Um, final note about this one, don't forget this. And that's as you mentioned in the back. PG dump backs up a single database. There are objects in Postgres that are not inside databases. These are your users, these are your groups, these are your table space definitions. You need to bump dump them as well. For this, we use PG dump all with the parameter dash G. That dumps only the global objects. If you don't do this, your backups will not restore. You have to manually go in and create the users, which is fine if you have two of them and not if you have hundreds of them. This will, ge this will always generate the plain text dump. But unless you actually have millions of users, that's not a problem. And if you have millions of users, you have a bigger problem. They should not be database users if there are millions of them. Please. <laughs> No. Minus G means global objects only. <coughs> if you just do PG dump all, it will dump every single one of your databases in plain text mode plus the globals. Dash G says ignore that, do globals only. So moving on to the other options that we have, which is physical backups. Uh, because we said logical was slow, right? Well, physical is slow too, I'm sorry. Everything is slow. We need faster machines. Now, physical backups in Postgres is basically comes from this. Postgres stores its databases in files, as I'm sure you've seen. There's lots of them with very funny names. We can back up these files. It's pretty easy. No need to parse. No need to query anything. We don't need to read up. We don't need to decompress and toast data. We don't need to do all of that stuff. So it's much, much faster. It also becomes architecture dependent. You cannot move a physical backup between two different architectures say, 32 uh, and 64-bit, big and little endian, that will not work. It will become Postgres version dependent. You, can, you have to restore to the same version. Now, yes, that means the same major version. I think officially you have to restore it to the same major version and the same or later minor version. But in fairness, it works with an earlier one as well. But you, since you should always be on the latest minor version, that's not a problem. It is also dependent on your compiler flags. If you are installing your database using a package, say an RPM or a Debian package, or even the installers, those package maintainers make sure that they use the same flags so that this is compatible. It's a long time since that broke. It broke in the RPMs in like 8.2 or something when they changed integer date times. Um, and your paths might, must be identical. You need to restore it to the same place. That's kind of restrictive, but when you think about it, when you're doing backups, that's not necessarily a problem. Because usually, if you want to restore, you want to restore onto equivalent hardware. You did, didn't suddenly switch when you're restoring. You didn't you know, switch from Linux on Intel to Solaris on Spark. You probably restore to something similar. Uh, so that's usually not a problem. What might be a problem is that it only supports full cluster backups. So you can't say, take a backup of this one database out of my 100 databases. You have to back them all up as one step. Again, for backups, quite often that's OK. okay but really, it's, it is a limitation. It would be nice not to have that limitation, but we do. So the easiest way to do physical backups really still is offline backups. It is easy. How do we do it? Stop Postgres, take backup, start Postgres. Now, if you can do this, it's the easiest one. You can backup your files exactly however you want, because Postgres isn't running. Postgres doesn't care. It's just files. You can use tar, you can use copy, you can use file system snapshots, you can email them away, you can do whatever you want. Uh, now, of course, in most scenarios, this is not an acceptable solution because of this tiny little step up here that says stop Postgres. That means stop your application. How many people are in the luxury of saying, well, my application is really only used between 8 and 5. Nobody ever uses it in the evenings, right? Yeah. But if you can, I mean, if you have an application that's only used, I mean, I have customers who have applications that are only used for one hour a day, then don't underestimate the simplicity of this option because it just works. Now, you cannot do this if Postgres is running. It may look like you could, but your, ba your backup will not work. Uh, the, another very simple way of doing it is simple snapshot backups. It means we're using file system or SAN based snapshots while the database is running. As long as your snapshot can guarantee that this, or your snapshot system, whether it's, you know, it could be LVM, could be ZFS snapshots, could be your SAN, uh, supports atomic snapshots across all Postgres data. 
That means all your table spaces, including the PGX log directory, which is your transaction log. If it can guarantee this, then you can just do the snapshot and you're done. It will just work. Now, in most cases, that's going to be a problem, particularly if these things are on different file systems. You're down to you know, enterprise very, very expensive SANS to be able to do that. And it may, it's one of those things, if they're not exactly atomic, if they differ even on the microsecond level, you can bet it's going to work in your testing and it's going to fail in production. And you won't know until you try to restore. Actually, you won't even know when you restore. You will know it a week after you restore, when you realize that there was corruption in the thing you restored. But it can be quite useful in small installations. And the advantage is you don't have to do anything. It just works. Uh, but what you're usually going to end up doing is online based backups, as we call them. This is non-constrained file system level backups, meaning you can do whatever you want anywhere you want while we're running the backup, but we still do it at file system level. We do this and we recover it by using our transaction log. So we combine these base backup with the transaction log. With just the base backup, it doesn't restore. It needs the transaction log. We can do this with or without what's called log archiving. If we do it with the log archiving, this is the base for the point in time recovery, the ability to restore not just the backup, but any arbitrarily chosen point in time, which is where we want to end up going. Now, there are, of course, multiple different ways that we can do this. The easiest way to do an online base backup is to use the integrated base backup functionality. This is new as of Postgres 9.1. But you're all running. Who is not running 9.1 or newer? Wow. Oh, OK, there you go. <laughs> well, now you've got another reason to upgrade, right? Uh, this runs on top of the replication protocol because they're very similar. So in order to use this, you must enable replication. Even if you don't have any actual replication, you must configure Postgres to support replication. You do this by setting the parameter while level to archive, or hot standby, but at least archive. And you set the value max while senders to at least two. In theory, you can set it to one, but always set it to at least two. And you know, set it to 10. Keep a little bit of margin if you get network issues, or if you want to run multiple backups at the same time, or something like that. Um, and then you run the simple command pg base backup. This simple command right here is the simplest way to do the full backup of Postgres. pg base backup, give it a user, because it has to log in to the replication. This user must have replication privileges. Uh, dash d tells it, write it to this directory over here. Dash capital P gives you a progress report. Unlike PG dump, this one can actually give you a progress report that tells you, you know, I've done 25%. You know, you can go have a coffee. I'm not going to be done anytime soon. Dash X is the important one. If you omit your dash X, your backup will not be restorable without a log archive. But if you include dash X, PG based backup will put enough transaction log in your backups so that the backup is standalone restorable. That you do not need any log archiving, you do not need anything externally, it just works. In fact, you can dump this in two different formats. If you dump it in a tar format, it will give you a tar file. If you run it in the default format, which is plain, it will actually reconstruct your data directory in, in this case, in this backup directory right here. So after you've run this command, you can actually do pgctl, point to this directory and say start, and it will start to Postgres in your backups. That's the format of the backups that you get, uh, which means they're completely standalone. They will just boot up, and you've got something running. That's pretty easy. Now, this will give you the one-off backup capability. This is the one you put in your cron job if you don't want to do anything complicated. This is the physical backup equivalence of pgdump. Uh, if you want to go all the way, you need to use something called log archiving. It's a bit of a pain in the ass to set up. But once you have it, it becomes fantastically useful. Uh, how it works is that whenever Postgres finishes with a log file, and this is transaction log file, we're not talking about your system log that says, you know, this user logged in or whatever. It's the binary transaction log. When it's finished a transaction log, uh, it's sent to the log archive, this new concept over there. When we're restoring, we read it from the log archive. So basically, when we restore, we take this base backup, which was taken at a certain point in time, and then we read all our transaction log back from this log archive. We can roll forward through this. And the feature here that we're looking for is the one called point in time recovery, which is that we can stop. So say we restore the backup from last night. 
and we start reading the log archives since last night, and we just keep going. If we keep going till the end, which is you know, a second ago, then our database as restored will look like it did a second ago. But we can also tell it to stop at 9 o'clock this morning, which is you know, when someone got back from the pub and did drop table. That's why you should not log into your database if you get back from the pub at 9 o'clock in the morning. And if you do, you should make damn sure you have working uh, point in time recovery. Uh, that's sort of the theory behind this. The way it works in Postgres is, so like say it's both good and bad, and uh, it lets you do it any way you want. That's the good part. The bad part is it requires you to define what this way is, even in the simple cases. Uh, <clears throat> what we do is we set a parameter called archive mode equals on. This is one of those annoying parameters that requires a Postgres restart. Because once you do this, we will start up the log archiver subsystem. We'll start a separate process that does this. Then you define a command that's archive command that just says it's a shell command that you can define to anything you want. What Postgres will tell that command is take this file over here and archive it under this name. It's up to you to define what that means. A typical example is you rsync it off to your archive server. You may copy it to an NFS mount. But you can do anything you want. You can you know, send it via email. That used to be my go-to for showing that you can do anything you want. Then I thought of a better idea. You can post it to Twitter, <laughs> split up, it works. Uh, it works for a very short while before you get blocked by Twitter. Because you're sending 16 megabyte chunks. That's quite a lot of tweets for one file. Uh, and they do detect that. But it works. And you can restore it. it it's, it's unusually complicated. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, another typical thing, if you actually want it to be in the cloud, you know, use Amazon S3 or something like that. That's a very good way of doing it, unlike Twitter. And the only thing that you promise, other than being able to do this and being able to tell Postgres if you succeeded or failed, is that you must also be able to define a restore command, which will do the other thing around. Postgres will just tell me, you know, this file that you previously archived under this name, give it back to me and put it over here. So if you rsynced it away, well, then you're going to rsync it back. Copy it to an NFS server, copy it back. Emailed it off, I don't know, IMAP it back. Post it to Twitter, yeah, just don't do that. But the only thing that you guarantee is you can get it back when it's being requested at this spe specific name. The rest is up to you. <coughs> Uh, there are some limitations in this that we've fortunately worked around a little bit more now. Uh, it requires, it, it always uses 16 megabyte segments, which means that if you have a database with very low velocity, it might, you might not generate 16 megabytes of transactions in a day, but the ones you generate are very important. For this, we have a parameter called archive timeout, which tells Postgres to, you know, even if I didn't generate these 16 megabytes in, say, I don't know, 30 minutes, send it anyway. Uh, the problem here is that we'll send the full 16 megabyte file, even if there's nothing in it. And it won't even be zero padded. It will contain random junk. So it doesn't compress particularly well. Uh, so otherwise, you just set that to one second, and now you're done. That's not going to help you. Now, uh, in Postgres up to 9.1, we solve this problem by replication. You have a replication slave. You know, if you get a hardware crash, so you need to restore to anywhere within the past 10 minutes, you just use your replication slave. If someone dropped the table, well, if you shut the server down, it will archive the file. So that's not the problem. Uh, but it still gives you uh, kind of anything. And it requires a replication slave. Maybe you didn't actually need replication for anything else. For this reason, as opposed to 9.2, we have a tool called PG Receive Xlog that you can run that will actually pretend to be a replication slave. It's basically, it is a Postgres replication slave without Postgres. We just took the database out. So it will receive your transaction log in real time and rebuild the log archive. So you'll be running this on your log archiving server somewhere. So now you really can't run it on Twitter. Um, and it will rewrite the files. And it'll generate them byte by byte instead of 16 megabytes by 16 megabytes. Uh, and that does solve the problem properly all the way. So in order to use this, you need a base backup again. Luckily, we can generate this base backup very simply. We can use PG base backup again, just remove the dash x. This is the default mode for PG base backup. You just say it here, take my base backup, put it over here. Once you've done that, you've got something to work with for your log archive. It does not now, at this point, restore without the log archive. That's what the dash x was for. You have to choose. Actually, you don't. You can still use dash x. Your backups will be unnecessarily large, but they will still work. You can also use what we call the manual method of doing base backups. 
Uh, this is the old way as well that you used in earlier versions of Postgres, which is you connect to the database, you say PG start backup, and then you copy all your files, and we don't care how you copy them. You can use copy, rsync, snapshots, tar, whatever. The files will change while you back them up. That's not a problem. We'll be able to restore from whichever state you restored them in or, or back them up in, as long as you don't miss them. And then you run PG stop backup when you're done. Most common thing that people make a mistake with this one is they don't check the error code of every single step. This is a multi-step operation. If any one of the steps fail, your backup is corrupt and not usable. So check the error codes. And really, use PG base backup if you can. It will take care of things for you. It will make sure things are restored and reset properly if something goes wrong. Now, when we look at the system impact of PG based backup, uh, it's sort of similar in a way to PG dump. It has much lower impact. It will read all your data. Unlike PG dump, it will read the data from your indexes because it just reads the file on disk. Uh, it generates a lot of I.O., but it generates sequential I.O. So it's relatively cheap I.O. It is single threaded. So I like to say that's probably a good thing. Otherwise, we'd kill your I.O. really, really quickly, since we can read so much faster than copy can. Uh, we have the same sort of a copy thing with uh, PG base backup. You can add compression. Compression happens in PG base backup. We can use this to throttle this one as well. If we're generating too much I.O., increase compression. It goes slower. But we have even less impact on the system in the form of locking while this thing is running. It doesn't lock anything. You can drop and create tables just fine while the backup is running. So throttling it might well be a good idea there. Um, when we look at restore performance of this, first of all, it will be orders of magnitude faster than PG restore. Quite often, orders of magnitudes of orders of magnitude faster. Uh, suddenly, your terabyte database will you know, restore in hours, not weeks. That's a good thing. Uh, it will depend on the distance to base backup. Because the restore has you restoring the full base backup, copying all those files, and then copying every transaction log file since that backup to the point you're restoring to. Now, depending on whether you have a database that is large but with low velocity, or small but with high velocity, either one of those can be the fastest. Right? If you have a very small database that takes huge amounts of updates, restoring the base backup will be really quick. But then you have to load loads and loads of transaction logs which may have just been updating the very same row. Whereas you can have a huge database that's multiple terabytes, you restore that, and then you had 100 megs of transaction log to replace. So that's going to depend on exactly where you are uh, and what you've got. For that reason, you'll probably want multiple generations of base backups. Exactly how often you take is going to depend on the velocity of your database and the size of it. And of course, the SLAs that tell you how long you're allowed to wait for the restore. Uh, the only real way to figure that out properly is to test. To try it. So I'm starting to run out of time, and I haven't actually started talking about backup strategies, which is what we said we were here. I've just talked about the options. Um, let me start with the most important of everything in your backup strategies. Please make backups. Okay. I, yes, as a Postgres consultant, I can make a lot of money by helping people who didn't make backups try to recover you know, whatever is left of their database. But I don't like doing that. I like doing more constructive things. So please make backups. Don't forget about them. So how do you make these backups? Well, you probably, you definitely want an online physical backup. Really, nobody does not want this today. Prior to PG-based backup, maybe you could avoid it because it was kind of annoying. As of PG-based backup, just do it. You want at least that. You almost certainly, if you have a mission-critical database, if you have a lot of stuff in it, you almost certainly want point-in-time recovery. Not just, you know, hey, let's restore backup from yesterday. Yeah, you do that in, late in the afternoon. You've had 1,000 people working eight hours on data in that database. You just threw that away. With point-in-time recovery, maybe you threw away five minutes instead of eight hours. You probably want that, almost certainly. And then you probably want PG dump as well. Because you know, really, this is backup. You know, this whole let's do belts and suspenders and whatever else we can think of if everything else fails kind of thing. If you can do PG dump, you probably want it. If you have a multi-terabyte database, you can't. Like it really doesn't work. It's not going to work for you. But if you have a smallish database, just run it. Maybe not as often. Maybe you do a daily online physical backup and a weekly PG dump. 
These are also useful. For example, pgdump will actually read all your data through the SQL level. It'll help you detect corruption that may have happened from a hardware failure on your machine. It'll actually go through the data. It has other wins. Uh, another big thing you have to ask yourself is backup retention. And that's the, one of the difficult things is you need to actually go to your business people and ask them what they need. Now the fact that if, you, if we have to restore a database as it looked a year ago, is, that e is there even any point to that? Is there anything interesting in the way it looked that way? Is there a point in it? On the other hand, we might be dealing with, say, financial data or anything that's regulated where we need to be able to restore it to 10 years ago. That's actually going to be hard. You do use PG dump if you have that requirement, because you're otherwise going to have to restore it on a 10-year-old version of Postgres. And we don't support that. So PG dump, if you actually need to restore something 10 years from now, that is a plain text format. Plain text formats have not changed in 10 years. Like we still have ASCII. We still have eight byte bytes. May have, may have UTF-8 on top of it. I think we're going to have UTF-8 10 years from now. I hope we're not going to have Postgres 9.1 10 years from now, for your sake. Uh, we should have done things. So it's all about how, what does it make sense? Or does it make sense to actually be able to do with you know, one second interval restore the database 10 years ago? Or is it OK to say, well, if it's 10 years ago, I can go down to monthly retention. You have to choose month, not second. So a lot of things there. Unfortunately, it comes back down to the business requirements. It's not something that we as technical people can actually dictate. We can ask for business requirements, and then we can try to build something that at least pretends to do what they ask for. Because quite often, what they ask for is not doable. Uh, or very, very expensive. And then you tell them that, and they say, make it cheaper. Uh, we need to deal with log file and base backups. Remember that a restore requires the base backup plus all log files since the backup. It does not allow you to have any holes. Your log archive is really, really, really important. If you lose a single file in your log archive, you get a break in what you can restore from. This is also a reason why we need to run base backup. In theory, we could run one base backup and just have a huge log archive. It will take forever to restore. And if you lose a single file, your backups are gone. So we need some sort of a reasonable level of when we run our base backup. It might be on a daily level, might be on a weekly level. Uh, another common thing is there's no point in keeping anything in the log archive older than the oldest base backup you're keeping. Because we'll always go forward. We can never go back. Backup and replication, you want both, probably. If you can only afford one, it will be backups. Okay, Backups solve a problem without replication that is more important than the one that replication solves without backups. But you really want both of them. Replication is excellent for recovering from hardware failure. Because you get up and running within seconds instead of minutes, hours, or days. With much, much shorter service interruption. You need backups as well. But that doesn't mean you don't need replication. Another useful thing that you can do around this to restore, the, uh, to, to decrease your stop here is using lag behind replicas. This is not something we support on the streaming replication protocol, but we do support it on the file-based replication, which is basically you create a delay in your replication system intentionally. Normally, we want to keep our replicas as close to the master as possible. But say you create a replica that's running 12 hours behind. That means as long as you detect the error that somebody did within 12 hours, what you can do is you can actually fast forward that replica, remove the delay, and fast forward it up until ju just before this problem without having to do a full restore. And we can do this easily if we use file-based replication in Postgres. Because we just need to define a command that looks, you can just look at the date of the file and just not copy it until you have, to have a staging area that sits 12 hours behind. It's fairly simple to set up. It can be very useful if you need to be able to do quick restores on very large systems. Yes? So like, you might, you have to that you have one, you have one, you have one, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, you'll want one that's up to date to deal with the hardware problem. Yeah. And then you'll want a lagged one to deal with user problems. Or you know, if the hardware problem is it created corruption. So the next really, really important thing, please test your backups. How many people regularly test your database backups? Oh, that's almost you know, a fifth of the room. How many of you have ever tested your database backups? And that was because it didn't crash? So do test your backups. OK, we, we, we don't always test your backups. I actually have a customer. They run a fairly important Postgres database. They test their restore every day. Every morning when the DBA gets in, he restores the database. And he runs test scripts and data verification to make sure it works. 
Now, they have one database. You can't do that if you have 1,000 databases. That would be way too expensive. They have one database, and if this database crashes and doesn't restore, they don't have a company. There's nothing left. So for them, that makes sense. For most people, that probably doesn't make sense. But there's a big difference between that and testing once when you set it up and never again. Yep? It is a feature to test your backups without doing a restore. Uh, I don't, think there is, I don't think there is anything in the queue for testing your backups without doing a restore, because why not just do a restore? I mean, you don't need an extra license for the separate machine to restore on Postgres, because you do an Oracle. Uh, just boot up a virtual machine somewhere, restore it in there. Then you've actually tested the right thing. The other advantage of it is um, what I like to do is also, when, when a typical example is when you're using this for staging or dev, restore from backup. Don't do that. Don't build a new one. Why? Because you also implicitly train your personnel. Now when this happens at 3 o'clock in the morning, you've actually done it before. You know how it's done. Which is also, yeah, if you're, your test should be restored because then you know the whole process works and you know how to do it. Yeah, exactly. So when, when, you know, when the developers want, we need a new update version of the database for development, you know, a lot of people will then go take a copy from the master right away. I say, don't do that. Go to your backups, because now you tested your backups. And it came for free. Exactly, at least two. Three, because you trained your people. As I say, well, and don't automate. As in, you should automate, but you shouldn't automate everything. Like, there should be the same manual process as there will be when you do a real restore. It needs to be there, again, so that you're used to doing the right things. Uh, well, I'm already significantly over time, but luckily there was a long break after me, so uh, you got to stay. But uh, thank you very much for showing up. If you have any questions, I think we'll let you out, but feel free to approach me here uh, and ask questions after. And if you have interesting war stories from backups, I'm interested to hear them. Yes, you're going to be able to get a copy of my slides. Uh, if you, instead of going to blog.hagener.net, you go to hagener.net slash talks. It's there already. The only difference is it'll say some other conference, but it's there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'll, we'll, thank you.